Welcome back to this series on neural network programming. In this video, we will introduce the fashion in this data set. We'll look at the data set spec, how the data set was built, and how the data set differs from the original MNIST data set of handwritten digits. Without further ado, let's get started. Let's kick things off by pondering the question of why we should take the time to study a data set to begin with. Data is the primary ingredient of deep learning, and although it's our task as neural network programmers to let our networks learn from our data, we still have the responsibility of knowing the nature and history of the data we're using to actually do the training. You have said, we're talking about data. Yeah, data. You said machines had drink, drank, had drank electricity. electricity, now they will drink data. Data is our water and our soil. Yeah. What does that, that is a, mean? Well, in the future, in the office, there are electricity, there are water, and the pipe of uh, the uh, data. If you want to make machine smart, the machine must drink data. Computer programs in general consist of two primary components, code and data. With traditional programming, the programmer's job is to directly write the code or software. But with deep learning and neural networks, the software, so to speak, is the network itself. And in particular, the network's weights that emerge automatically during the training process. From this perspective, the actual software produces itself through the training process. It's the programmer's job to oversee and guide the learning process through training. We can think of this as an indirect way of writing software or code. By using data and deep learning, neural network programmers can produce software capable of performing computations without actually writing the code to explicitly carry out these computations. For this reason, the role of data in developing software is shifting, and we'll likely see the role of software developers shift as well. As a developer, if we want to tweak our software or make a change, opposed to tweaking the code directly, we will be tweaking the data. Now, just to break this down a little bit, uh, all of us are training neural networks, and um, I'd like to argue that uh, what's going on is actually much deeper than just training some machine learning models. I think what's going on is that we're actually fundamentally changing a programming paradigm. We're introducing a new programming paradigm. Um, normally, what you would be familiar with is you want some kind of a program that performs something that is desirable uh, for your application, and you would just specifically write the C++ code or JavaScript code or something like that. And instead, we're doing, what we're doing now with machine learning is that we are instead defining a set of programs that we are going to search over, then we introduce a data set that kind of constrains or gives like soft constraints on desirable behavior of the program. And then we are using optimization to actually like write that code. So stochastic gradient descent is really writing the code. And that code is in weights of a neural network instead of something like C++. And so uh, a lot of these models that are kind of written in this new programming paradigm are kind of uh, taken over. And so in particular, the uh, the point I'd like to make is that this is not just like training an imagement model or something like that. When you are working with these networks in production, you are doing much more than that. You are maintaining the code base. In particular, you have new feature demands for the 2.0 stack. The stack contains bugs, and you need to clean them up. And this code base really requires iteration and, and love over time uh, to get it to work in your application, uh, except the knobs that you have with respect to programming in, in this new stack is uh, you are not writing the code to actually fix your bugs, but you are iterating on the data set, you're iterating on the model class, and you're iterating on the optimization that you're using to actually uh, train your model. In practice, acquiring and accessing data is often the hardest part of deep learning. So keep this in mind as we go through this particular data set. Take note of the general concepts and ideas that we see here. Pay close attention to things like who created the data set, how the data set was created, what transformations occurred during the pre-processing of the data, what intent does the data set have, if any, and whether it's possible the data inside the data set is biased in any way, and whether there are any ethical issues at play. These are all critical skills that will aid neural network programmers as we move into the future of deep learning. How are we thinking about this, and, and, and are we thinking about AI in the right way? People think about these computers making decisions for us, but there's actually an important step that happens before it, which is how does a computer get trained? Well, a computer gets trained with enormous amounts of data. Yeah, and AI and computers, are, they're not necessarily unbiased. They're not. Mm -hmm. The point is that this is a land grab for data. And, you know, why there's so much concern about these large companies 
the large internet companies is because of the enormity of the data that they've collected. Because on the one hand, you could use it to improve basic core services, but on the other hand, it may be too much power in the hands of a few. And so what we really need to do is have a more nuanced discussion. When we talk about AI and we talk about the perils of it, it really comes down to who is collecting the critical information that will train our computers over the next 20 to 30 years to make important differentiated decisions on our behalf. So who is? I mean, who's 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 in the lead? Well, there's the is obvious it? companies in certain categories. Uh -huh. So if you said, you know, who is going to be the leader in collecting data around consumption? I would say it's Amazon. Mm. If you asked about, you know, intent, it would be Google. If you talked about content consumption, it would be Facebook. Mm. But for example, in healthcare, there's no clear winner yet. Mm. In education and adaptive learning, there's no clear winner yet. Mm. In financial regulation, the issuance of credit, uh, there's no clear winner yet. So there's these many, many markets where we don't know yet. Um, and so now it's about figuring out how to start companies, quite honestly, who think about this as their core primary reason to exist, and then collect data and then use it in a really thoughtful and honorable way. The MNIST data set is a pretty much famous data set of handwritten digits commonly used in training image processing systems for machine learning. NIST, with an N, stands for National Institute of Standards and Technology. The M in MNIST stands for modified. And this is because there was an original NIST data set of digits that was then modified to give us MNIST. MNIST is famous because of how often the data set is used commonly used for two reasons. Number one, beginners use it because it's relatively easy. And number two, researchers use it to benchmark or compare different models. The data set consists of 70,000 images of handwritten digits with the following split. We have 60,000 images in the training set. We have 10,000 images in the testing set. The images were originally curated by employees of the American Census Bureau and high school students. MNIST has been so widely used and image recognition tech has improved so much that the data set is considered to be too easy now. This is why in a nutshell, the Fashion MNIST set was created. Fashion MNIST, as the name suggests, is a data set of fashion items. Specifically, the data set has the following 10 classes of fashion items. We have t-shirt, trouser, pullover, dress, coat, sandal, shirt, sneaker, bag, and ankle boot. All right, so where did the Fashion MNIST images come from? Well, Fashion MNIST is based on the assortment from Zylando's website. Wanna know what we have for Zylando's 10th birthday? I've got this. What about this? Three, six, nine girls wanna look fine. Tell the man not to waste your time. The man broke, the man here joke. We can do better. You can, you can stay in IT. The exclusive CK Jeans collection. Now. Only for Zalando's birthday. More exclusives only at Zalando. Zalando is a German based multinational fashion commerce company. This is why we see Zalando Research in the GitHub URL where the Fashion MNIST dataset is available for download. Zalando Research is the group within the overall company that actually created the dataset. So there's a looming question here. What's MNIST about a fashion data set? After all, NIST is a separate organization from Zalando. Well, the reason the fashion MNIST data set has MNIST in its name is because the creators are seeking to replace the original MNIST data set. So the fashion MNIST data set was designed in such a way that it mirrors the original data set in terms of its spec. It does this as closely as possible while still introducing a higher level of difficulty in terms of training. We'll see the specific ways the fashion set does this when we look at the fashion MNIST data set paper. However, one clue has already been revealed to us, and that's the number of classes. The original MNIST dataset has 10 classes, one for each digit, 0 through 9, and the Fashion MNIST dataset also has 10 classes that correspond to 10 pieces of clothing. The implication of this in neural networks is that neural networks that have been trained on the original MNIST dataset can be swapped over to the Fashion MNIST dataset without changing their output layers. Let's check out the paper now and reveal the other similarities. The paper can be found here on the archive website. To see the paper, we just click the PDF link. 
The first thing to notice about the paper is that the authors are from Xylando Research, the origin, as we've seen, of the Fashion in this data set. After reading the paper's abstract, we can see pretty clearly why the dataset has been named Fashion Mnist. Ahem, <clears throat> the abstract. We present Fashion Mnist, a new dataset comprising of 28 by 28 grayscale images of 70,000 fashion products from 10 categories, with 7,000 images per category. The training set has 60,000 images and the test set has 10,000 images. Fashion Mnist is intended to serve as a direct drop-in replacement for the original Mnist dataset for benchmarking machine learning algorithms, as it shares the same image size, data format, and the structure of training and testing splits. The dataset is freely available at this link here. So the Fashion MNIST dataset was designed to be a drop-in replacement for the original MNIST dataset. By making the Fashion MNIST dataset specs match the original MNIST specs, the switchover from old to new can be smooth. The paper claims that the only change needed to switch datasets is to change the URL from where the MNIST dataset is fetched by pointing to the Fashion MNIST dataset. The paper also gives us more insight as to why MNIST is so popular. The reason MNIST is so popular has to do with its size, allowing deep learning researchers to quickly check and prototype their algorithms. This is also complemented by the fact that all machine learning libraries like scikit-learn and deep learning frameworks like TensorFlow and PyTorch provide helper functions and convenient examples that use MNIST out of the box. PyTorch does indeed provide us with a package called TorchVision that makes it easy for us to get started with MNIST as well as Fashion MNIST. And we'll be using TorchVision in our next video to load our training set into our project. One thing that we'll see in that video is that PyTorch's implementation of the Fashion MNIST dataset is indeed an override of the MNIST dataset class by just doing a swap out of the URLs. Unlike the MNIST dataset, the fashion set wasn't hand-drawn, but the images in the dataset are actual images from the Zalando website. However, they have been transformed to more closely correspond to the MNIST specifications. This is the process they went through. After the images were pulled from the site, they were first converted to PNG, then trimmed, then resized, then sharpened, extended, negated, and grayscaled. To see more detailed description of this process, be sure to check out section two of the paper here. To open the box of this whole AI thing, and maybe some of you already played around a bit with TensorFlow or, or did some image classification, the standard data set you, you get is this MNIST data set on the left here where you're supposed to classify what this digit means. So the upper left one would be a five, for example. And, and uh, actually, we thought last year, this is, this is a bit boring. And as it turns out, it was boring for, for the whole uh, academic world as well. So we published the Fashion MNIST data set. Uh, which is actually pictures from our catalog, and uh, it was actually quite successful. So many people are using it now to benchmark their methods with these uh, fashion articles. And here it's, it's completely analog. That's why it had such a big impact, because it's the same data format. In particular, in the image space, the best solutions are deep learning. And for deep learning, you actually have to mainly define two things. You have to define the architecture, that is how you build your network, how you connect your neurons, your artificial brain cells, to produce an output from the input, and you have to define a loss function. And the loss function is, is basically how you measure how good your system is. So we've seen the origin and history of the fashion in this data set. Although the data set is designed to be a more challenging computer vision problem, the set is still a great place to start. We will be accessing the fashion in this set through the PyTorch vision library called Torch Vision and building our first neural network that can accurately predict output classes given an input fashion image. Let us hear from you in the comments. Have you previously heard of fashion in this before? And also let us know how long you've been interested in neural networks. Networks. Tell us in terms of days, months, or years. We look forward to hearing from you. Share this video so we can spread collective intelligence. Thanks for learning with us, and I'll see you in the next one. So being both in academia and industry you know, really has helped me uh, look at a large array of problems that arise in industry, but so far haven't received that much attention. Because when it comes to AI and machine learning, there are really three pillars, right? There is the data, there are the algorithms, and then there's the compute infrastructure. 
So most of the time we spend in academia is on algorithms. How can I get the best algorithm? What kind of bound does this have? You know, what kind of sample complexity? What kind of computational complexity? What are the problem instances it's going to solve? But then in industry, there is so much more that we are, to, we are faced with. You know, most of the time, we don't have data. How do I get labeled data? And there is so much noise in that process. You know, I'm training on one data set and then have to serve one another. How do I deal with this? And then I have to scale this up on large-scale infrastructure. And what are the challenges involved there? And it's so critical to have open source software frameworks like PyTorch to really enable us to realize the algorithms. Right? So this is, to me, the beginning of how for academic research and industry research really has to you know, come even closer to one another and tackle problems together.